Hey everyone, welcome to Southland today. So grateful that you've joined us for the online service. We're always excited to just get to do this together, to be able to spend some time in worship. Here at Southland, we're really excited about connection. We want you to be connected with Jesus first. Uh, that's going to change your life and change your forever life. And so we're really excited about helping people to make that connection. We also want you to get connected with some other people, to build the friendships where you can follow Jesus together and encourage one another along the way. Another connection we'd love to help you make is to help you to get connected to that place of serving where your God-given gifts make a difference in the world around you. Hey, we've got a great team of people here to take care of you today, and we would love for you to get to know them. Our, our volunteer and staff team is amazing, and if you jump in the chat, you can interact with them right now. Ask any questions you might have. They would love to help you in any way that they can. And you would also not just be interacting with our team, but also with folks from literally around the world. It's a really cool experience. While you're there, click the Request Prayer button. You can have a private, direct message conversation with one of our team members. They would love to pray for you. They would love to pray with you. It would be our honor to get to do that right here today. A couple other ways that you can be a part of the online service is click that button up at the top left of your screen. That's a menu that's going to drop down. You can learn more about giving. Uh, whether it's the first time that you give of your resources for ministry here at Southland or, or it's, uh, you do this on a regular basis, that's an easy place where you can just click and learn more about sharing what God has given to you to make a difference in the lives of other people. You can also click the Next Steps button. That's one of the most important things to us is to help you make that connection with Jesus. So whether you're learning about baptism or you just want to talk with one of our team members to go, hey, here's where I'm at. Where could I move next in order to grow closer with Jesus? We'd love to help you do that. You can click the groups button. We're going to be launching groups here really soon. So it's a perfect time to learn more about starting a group and about joining a group. And we definitely want you to be watching for more information related to that. And if you don't see what you're looking for, click the connect button, share your information. We will reach out this week to see how we can help you to take steps towards getting connected here at Southland. Well, Southland is one church with many locations. And as you can see, we are open. And so at the next convenient time when it makes sense for you to join us in person, we'd love to have you join us at Nicholasville or Lexington, Danville, Georgetown, or Richmond. And when you come, look for somebody in a blue need help shirt. That's one of our amazing guest experience team members, and they're here to help you get connected, help you navigate the experience here at Southland, and, and just help you in any way that you need. We would love to do that. Well, we're getting ready to jump in for worship right now, so let's get the service started and join in with the band.
Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to South. And we're so glad that you're here to worship with us as we kick off a brand new year and a brand new series today called Upstream. And I don't know about you, but I love seeing in that video all that, the good that God did through the church in 2020. And it makes me excited for what he's going to do in 2021. Now, as we continue this morning, we're going to continue to worship together. So why don't you stand as we sing together today?
to be thankful for as God leads us into this new year. Sing this new song with us. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters from my release. Oh, yeah. You're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory, hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep, hallelujah, hallelujah. sign that you are with me. The fire by night is a guiding light to my feet. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters from my release. Oh, yeah. You're the 
Great to be with you guys today. Would you grab a seat as we continue? Well, it's so good to worship you this morning, just to start things off by focusing on who God is and what he's done for us. And my name is Sean Denny, and I'm a pastor here at the Nicholasville campus, and we are so glad that you're with us to worship this morning. If this is your first time joining us, thank you for spending your Sunday morning with us. We're so grateful that you're here, and we know that you're going to leave encouraged today. A lot of us, as we start a new year, we start off with resolutions and goals and all that we want to accomplish. And one of the areas many of us think about is that area of connection and relationships. And we as a church want to help you be connected. We want to help you and your family get engaged with the church. So maybe you're new to Southland. Maybe you've been here a few times, but you've never taken that next step to get connected here, uh, to join a group, to serve, to find those things. And we would love to help you take that step. And we've made it really easy for you to do that. I just want to invite you today to text NEW TO SOUTHLAND to 97,000. And when you do that, new to Southland, text that to 97,000. Someone from our staff will be reaching out to you. And we're going to be talking about how you can take your next step, how you and your family can get connected and be engaged here at Southland as we move into 2021. Well, another area that we focus on, a lot of us are setting goals around, are our finances, especially after Christmas. Uh, and we talk a lot here at Southland about a financial plan that's really simple, simple but also very intentional. And that's our 10-10-80 plan for finances. Here's what that means. Uh, we encourage everybody to give 10%, the first 10% as an act of worship back to God because it all belongs to Him. And then because we all give, is because you're all so generous, we're able to do the Dollar Club. We're able to invest in our student ministry, our children's ministry, and then do local outreach in the community and global missions. It's because you all give 10%. And then we save 10%, we plan for the future, and we live off the remaining 80%. That's a simple, intentional way that we can all live and steward our finances. But if you're like me, and it's, it's really easy to just focus on the week-to-week -week or the month-to-month -month budget, and forget to plan for long, the long term, and to take care of my family down the road. So I want to let you know about an opportunity we have coming up tomorrow night where you can plan for your family. Uh, we have a free wills and estate planning webinar that's going to happen at 7 o'clock tomorrow night. Again, it's a webinar. It's going to be online, and you do need to register for that over at southland.church slash nicholasville. Uh, but if you do this, you're going to walk away with a plan for your family at no cost to you, and it's just one more way that you can intentionally think about and plan for your family and steward your finances in 2021. So I hope a lot of you will take advantage of that and join us tomorrow night online. Uh, well, again, we're glad you're here. As I mentioned earlier, we're kicking off a new series today called Upstream, and John's going to be teaching us this morning. So if you have your Bible or your Bible app, you can go ahead and open that up as we get ready for today's message.
Well, when I was four years of age, my parents decided they wanted to take our family to Disney World. And they made this conscientious decision to drive from Missouri to California. Now, what you need to know is at the time, we had an old Ford station wagon that looked something like this. Um, Did not have air conditioning. uh, Did not have power windows. The old windows you used to crank down. And then by every seat, some of you will recall this, they had these little leather loops that you could hold on to. And part of the reason that we had those was, one, we didn't wear seat belts, and two, the seats were made of vinyl. Do you remember vinyl seats? Like in the wintertime, they were like a sheet of ice. If your dad turned a corner, man, you were slipping and sliding across the back seat. But in the summer, it was just the opposite. A vinyl, it was like sitting on the other side, the sticky side of duct tape. Like, do you remember this when you were wearing shorts and you just couldn't quite get your legs off of it because it was so weird? Well, the trip for us was 30 hours. And uh, every hour on the hour, I would annoyingly uh, say to my parents, please tell me more about Disneyland. And my mom would speak with so much excitement and anticipation, anticipation in her voice that I couldn't fathom it. Like my little brain just couldn't get its head around the concept of Disneyland because the coolest place I had ever been to that point was Chuck E. Cheese. And we all know Chuck E. Cheese is like a dirty sock compared to Disneyland, right? And so we get there and no descriptive phrases or metaphors could capture the reality of what I was experiencing. I remember running through the front gates and there's the castle And then there's Swiss Family Robinson's treehouse. Like, I wanted to live in that treehouse, make bombs out of coconuts. That was my childhood dream. And then you start seeing all the characters, right? There's Pinocchio, there's Mary Poppins, and my favorite was Donald Duck. He comes up and hugs me, and I was speechless. Like, we didn't have ducks the size of people in Missouri, not even close. And so I was just overwhelmed. And I tell you that because it was even better, even better than anything I could have possibly imagined. You know, Jesus once said this when he was teaching, if your child asks for bread, do you trick him with sawdust? If he asks you for fish, do you scare him with a snake on his plate? As bad as you are, you wouldn't think of such a thing. You're at least decent to your own children, so don't you think that God who conceived you in love will be even better? Isn't it possible That if Disneyland could be better than we imagined, that God himself might be even better than anything we've ever dreamed of. I mean, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can conceive what God has prepared for those who love him. Friend, I'm convinced that one of the reasons we struggle to trust the goodness of God is because we're surrounded by badness on all sides all day long. Let me illustrate that point by just testing your geography skills. What is the longest river in the United States? Any guesses? Okay, some people say Mississippi. It's actually technically the Missouri River, 40 miles longer than the second longest river in our country, which is the Mississippi that most of you guessed. And we know this to be true about these big rivers, right? They're essentially good. Like they provide water, food for us, a mode of transportation. In this country, we figured out how to harness them to generate electricity power out of them. But we also recognize that they're dangerous. If they're not dealt with in the right way, like rivers can blow their banks, they can flood, and so we have to respect them as well. Now imagine if we took a a barrel like this, filled with toxic material, and we took millions more like it, and we went upstream. We went up to the headwaters, the source of these two rivers, and we just started dumping all of this contaminated material into the water. Well, the result downstream would be predictable, right? All these little creeks and tributaries would be polluted. Fish and birds and other wildlife would die. Humans would get sick, and there would be all kinds of repercussions from that. Now imagine, for the sake of discussion, that the people way down here in Louisiana assess the situation, and they say collectively, let's throw billions of dollars in money and medicine at the illness. But not one person in the group says, you know, maybe the wise thing would be to go upstream to the source and begin to figure out why we have this problem way down here to begin with. 2020, a lot of problems started coming to the surface in our country. And I think it's not an exaggeration to say everyone started wondering, man, where did that come from? How did we get here? 
And so TV and social media started lining up expert after expert to give their opinion. And we all tuned in, didn't we? We were curious to hear what the experts would say. And man, some people said, well, it's big tech companies' fault. We haven't reined them in enough. Some people said, you know, it it goes back further than that when we put people on welfare and rob them of the dignity of work and providing for themselves. And some people said, you know, it's when we made divorce in our court system easy to get. Some people said it's when we legalized abortion and made prayer in public schools illegal. People pointing the finger at capitalism said the Constitution's to blame. Wow, the list was long. And I can remember sitting in our house in August and just thinking to myself, We've become a nation that specializes in blaming the wrong things. We've become a nation that specializes in treating the symptoms of the sickness without ever dealing with the source of the sickness. Our attention's focused so far downstream that our our answer is always, well, let's build more schools. Let's build more hospitals, more government housing. We need more addiction treatment facilities. We need more attention paid to mental health and advertising there, and on and on it goes. And very few people ever get in the canoe and just work their way up to the source of the problem. So that's what this series is all about. Scott and I just want to extend an invitation to you. We're going to hand you a paddle. It's your decision whether or not you get in the boat and go upstream with us. But here's why we want to take you upstream. We're convinced, deep in our hearts, that spiritual problems require spiritual solutions. Racism, sexism, Addiction, child abuse, homelessness, poverty, suicide. You pick any pain that manifests itself in a physical or emotional way, and we're going to contend that the source of that pain is always spiritual. So let's start here. For the sake of discussion again, let's begin upstream, and let's start by renaming the rivers. Like, let's rename this one Adam, and let's rename the other one Eve. Now, you know from studying your Bible, the very first page of human history, that these two people come together in a garden called Eden, and they get married. And what happens? Right out of the gate, they make a conscientious, rebellious, prideful decision to tune out God's voice and to tune in Satan's voice. They decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going to disobey God, and we're going to obey Satan. And sin entered their hearts. Death and destruction entered the world that we now live in. And then what did they do? Well, they passed that tendency onto their children, Cain and Abel. You remember the story, Cain kills his brother Abel. Very first family on the planet, we have murder. And unfortunately for you and me, this is our family history. These are our grandparents, you all. These are our long lost uncles we got what we're dealing with here. What what we inherit from them? An appetite for badness that sometimes supersedes our appetite for goodness. And so the clearest analysis of the problem comes from the creator of people himself who has seen all of human history and every human tendency any of us have. And he said this to the prophet Jeremiah, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Now notice what God didn't do here. He didn't say, well, this is a social problem we're dealing with. This is an economic problem. This is a political problem. This is a physical or emotional problem. No, your creator, my creator said, the problem, singular, is spiritual in nature. And what flows out of that problem are all kinds of other problems, political, economic, social, physical, and emotional. And don't miss this. He created us for one another. And when you take a man with a heart problem and you introduce him to a woman with a heart problem, And they act like they don't have any problems. Or they act like the other person's the problem. Man, that relationship doesn't stand a chance. And what happens? It blows up. And then what happens downstream? Their children and generations to come are negatively impacted. Matter of fact, children in those kind of situations are five times more likely to commit suicide. Six times more likely to live in poverty. Ten times more likely to abuse drugs. Twenty times more likely to end up in prison. And the list is so long. But as a society, when we read those kind of stats, again, our thinking is, well, you know what we need? We need more suicide prevention. We need more drug abuse prevention. And so we live, we set up camp downstream. And the problem turns into problems. And it doesn't seem to be getting better. It seems to be getting worse. And I think it's because we're downstream, but I also think it's because we're failing to realize we have a very real enemy 
And he's still at the headwaters, just tipping barrel after barrel of toxic waste into the water system. So let me remind you of some truths about Satan before you jump into 2021 too far. You need to remember that Satan is God's enemy, but not God's equal. Now, I remember when I was in high school with my buddies, we would all put $5 in a hat and we would rent pay-per-view every Mike Tyson fight that was on TV because pound for pound, one of the greatest heavyweight boxers to ever step in the ring. Now, imagine if today you're watching ESPN and you see an advertisement for a fight between me and Mike Tyson. Your laughter kind of hurts my feelings, to be honest with you, all right? But you're wise to laugh because you know what would happen. I would get pummeled. Like if Tyson hit me in the face, my nose would shoot to the back of my skull and land somewhere in Ohio. And the reason that's true is because he has something I don't have. He has size and skill. He's 60 pounds heavier. He's 100 times quicker. He's been in the rings ring a lot more than me. He's got experience. It's not a fair fight. Why Satan decided to get in the ring with Jesus, I'll never know. But I can tell you this, it's not a fair fight. He is God's enemy, but he is not God's equal. And the minute you begin to believe otherwise, when you're watching the news, fear will creep in. You'll think someone else is in control other than God. Anger will begin to creep in because other people become your enemy other than him. And you'll feel hopeless. Our God is always a God of hope. And when you begin to believe that he has an equal, scary territory for you and me and us. Second thing I would remind you of is that Satan has been defeated, but not destroyed. Now we celebrate this on Easter, but we need to be reminded every single day. Jesus rose from the dead. Have you heard that? Jesus rose from the dead. And in that moment, what did he do? He took from Satan his greatest weapon against you and me, which is death. That's no longer in his arsenal. He can't threaten you with that. You have nothing to fear at all. But Satan is still alive and very active. Matter of fact, 1 Peter 5, verse 8 says, keep a cool head. Let me ask you this week when you were watching the news, did you do that? Keep a cool head. Stay alert, the devil's poised to pounce would like nothing more than to catch you napping. So keep your guard up. It's my opinion, but in our country, the way Satan is winning is by destroying the family. That singular problem I described in the heart of man and woman, it flows into the family. And Satan is destroying the family. And then you know what he's doing? He's deceiving us into believing that that's not really the problem. And then he's trying to get us to believe that Jesus really isn't the solution to that problem. Just think about it this way, guys. Think about what we're asking our educational system to do for children. Every day, we're asking teachers to teach our children, feed them, discipline them, counsel them, nurture them, clothe them, on and on it goes. In other words, we're asking teachers to do what God designed parents to do. And it doesn't stop there. Think about our healthcare system. I'm so concerned for doctors and nurses because we're asking you to be our physical saviors. We're legalizing marijuana. Does anyone in their right mind think think that's harmless? No. But now one person is asking, why is there an entire generation that wants to numb their emotions? We did the same exact thing with pornography and look where we are downstream from it. Friends, we know that pornography and sex before marriage, every study proves it, creates all kinds of bonding issues for people for life. And no one is asking, why are we sacrificing the joy that comes from a long-term monogamous committed relationship for the sake of short-term pleasure? We do it with food, the most basic of necessities. We know if we overeat and under-exercise, we're doomed. But no one's asking, why are millions of people in our country finding comfort in what they eat? On and on I could go. My point is this. We're asking politicians and police officers and social workers and therapists to do what God designed parents to do. And I know I'm in the minority on this, and I'm comfortable with that. I think it is a singular problem. Thus, I think it is a singular solution. I'll say it. Jesus is not a solution to the problem. Jesus is the solution to the problem. And friend, if you don't believe this, I love you, but I think you're part of the problem. 
And I have the authority of Scripture to back me up. Remember Paul's letter to the Corinthian church? What's he doing there? He's assessing cultural chaos in Corinth. And it's bad. It looks like the United States. But then Paul gets in his little spiritual canoe and he paddles way upstream. And in chapter 15, he offers us this assessment of the solution here. He says, so you see, just as death, that's the problem, came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. In other words, the pollution that Adam and Eve began and that we've contributed to, Jesus has said, I'll clean it up. I'll gladly clean it up if you let me. Now, imagine if I was holding a bowl of water with a goldfish in it. Got that image? And the fish is swimming around, and one day he says, I don't like being constrained to the water. I want to try life on land. So he hops out of the bowl onto the stage, and we're all sitting here watching this fish. What's the, the result? Well, it's predictable. He flops and flails and gasps for air and eventually dies. Now, the compassionate thing for me as a powerful being, as a reasonable being, bigger than him, would be to scoop him up and put him back in the water. And so that's what I do. Put him back in the water, and what's he do? Immediately begins to dive and dart and swim around in the water because that was the environment he was created for. And it's in that context that the fish finds security and freedom. You're no different. And I'm no different than that fish. We were created for a very specific context that has boundaries that were meant for our good, and anything on the other side of those boundaries will cause us to flop and flail, gas for air, and die. And that's why you're here today. That's why you're tuned in. Because you've tried it. I have too. Only to find out it did not deliver. And so if you'll let me, I want to put this on the positive end of things. I want to focus three thoughts on the solution that we can build on for the rest of this series. The first thought I would leave you with is this. The church supplements what God supplies. Now notice what I didn't say, the school system supplements or the government supplements. No, the church supplements what God supplies. So what essentially does God supply the planet with? Love. He's the source of all love. So he gives a man and a woman love and he allows them to come together and share that love for what purpose? Creation. Another life like him. We create children. So if that mom and dad don't keep going back to the source of that love, guess what? They're not going to have enough love for one another or for that child. And so what happens is many of you were raised in homes where you didn't get what you needed. And God knew that would be the case. So what did he do? In his genius, his design, he created a second family for you and me called the church. You're my brother. You're my sister. I say that with the deepest affection. And my role in this family is to expose us to the Father's love. But if if you think I'm the conduit for God's love, you're mistaken and you'll put pressure on me to be something superhuman that I'm not. So please hear me. The Father's the source of the love that you need and the Holy Spirit is the funnel through which he puts it in your heart. And he plants that seed and he waters that seed and grows it and develops it and he will weed out anything that threatens to choke it So friends, if you didn't get the kind of love you needed from your parents, welcome to the club. We're all in that boat. Playing the victim card like our society is doing at large as a whole will not help you or anyone in the least. You now know that God loves you, his church loves you, and if you let it, it can radically change your life. But as adults, what we all need to stop doing is whining about our problems, complaining about our problems, and blaming our problems on other people. It doesn't help us or our country at all. And that leads to my second observation. Responsibility plus accountability equals maturity. Now, I'll just go ahead and warn you. I know 50-year-old men who act like 15-year-old boys. You probably do too, right? The mantle of leadership falls on men. And so we have men in our country who cuss and drink and talk in hypersexualized ways about women. They shirk their responsibilities as husbands and dads. And then they, they, don't, they come to church, but that's about it. And you don't see anything that resembles discipline or holiness in their life. And at the same time, I know 15-year-old boys who act like 50-year-old men are supposed to. We have tons of them in this place. They're serving here. They're leading their friends to Jesus. They're little spiritual forces to be reckoned with. So this equation has nothing to do with age. It has everything to do with maturity and an appetite, a desire 
to not be polluted or contaminated by the world anymore. And that's where this book comes in. If you'll let me for just a minute, I want to teach you two Greek words that will change 2021 for you and everyone you come in contact with. The first one is found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and, and Paul said, all scripture, all scripture is God-breathed. He didn't say some, all of it is. And, and the Greek word Paul uses here is theonoustos. Everyone say theonoustos. This word literally means God breathed out. And what that means for us is this. Nicholas Sparks, Stephen King, John Grisham, Max Lucado, Beth Moore, incredible authors who have written incredible books, but not one of them can claim that a single word or sentence in any of their literature is theonoustos, God breathed. The distinctiveness of this book is found in the distinctiveness of its author. I'm claiming and I believe that God is the author of this book. And that, my friends, changes everything. We study it, we memorize it, we meditate on it, and we apply it to our lives because we believe in this book God answers life's biggest questions, four of them. First one is, where do we come from? Everyone needs to have the question of origin answered in their hearts and satisfied. Why are we here? What's our purpose? Why do we wake up in the day? What's right and what's wrong? And where are we going? Now, we believe at this church and we teach at this church that this book answers these questions with precision and clarity. But we're living in a culture that is trying to answer these questions in a different way than God has already answered them. Hear me on this. Our culture is trying to redefine big subjects that God has clearly defined. Marriage. Gender. Human sexuality. Justice, equality, that list is long. And not only are we arrogantly trying to redefine them, we have people who are trying to replace them with things, and I'm gonna call it what it is, that are deviant. And they are so dangerous for us, and downstream they will wreak havoc for generations to come. And what scares me the most about this is Christians are getting in that boat with the world. And they're trying to change what this book really says. As long as there's air in my lungs... I don't care if they throw me in prison or hold a gun to my head. I love you enough to tell you that's not an option. We cannot change the words of this book. The words of this book were meant to change us. And that's where this second Greek word comes in. And it is even better than the first. It's hupotasso. Everyone say hupotasso. And hupotasso means to come under. Yeah, the Bible translators sometimes in our English versions translate this as Submit. Oh, man, Americans, we don't like that word, do we? Submit to come under. So my degree in college, I spent four years of my life studying the historical accuracy and the validity of the claims of this book. And somewhere between ages 20 and 21, intellectually, I reached a conclusion in a library, in the basement of a library at a desk by myself, that the wisest thing I could ever decide to do in my life was to hupotasso it under the authority of this book, to come under its teaching. Well, what does that mean? First thing it means is that I'm gonna take responsibility for all of my, my thoughts. Not some of them. Every single thing that comes through my mind, I have to submit to the Lordship of Jesus. Every word out of my mouth and every action of my hands and feet, and I have to bring all of that under his authority. What does that mean? Well, it means, first of all, I don't blame my parents for any of it. I don't blame the educational system I went through for any of it. I don't blame society as a whole for anything that is a part of my life because the problem, according to this, is not out there. The problem's right here. It's in my heart. And that causes me to not only take responsibility, I realize I need help. I'm a scary individual if left to myself, so I embrace accountability. I want the young people of the church to hear this. I am joyfully submitted to the elders of this church. Submission is not a bad thing. I'm joyfully submitted to you, my church family, if you see something in me that is not Christ-like and you call me on it, I will humbly, prayerfully work on that with the Holy Spirit's help, hopefully change it. I'm joyfully submitted to my wife and my children because I'm with them all day. I can't hide from them. They see the worst in me, and I need that. I need them to tell me that, call me out on that. But most importantly, I am joyfully submitted to the author of this book who created me died for me, is coming to rescue me, and he will judge me. 
and I love you enough to say this, the United States as a whole is not gonna be judged. Southland Christian Church as a whole is not gonna be judged, meaning you're not gonna be able to just kind of blend into a crowd and kind of skate into heaven. Every single knee will bow, willfully or forcefully at the hand of God. And we will be before his throne and we will give account as individuals for everything we have ever said or done. And friend, I want you to not, look for, not be afraid of that day, but to look forward to that day. I want you to be ready for it. So that leads to my third thought. We want to grow God's church by strengthening your family. Uh, 2020 has given our elders and our executive staff an opportunity to pray and to evaluate our mission, vision, and strategy. And so over the next four weeks, you're going to hear Scott and I lay out in very specific details how we're going to reallocate a lot of our budget to strengthen your marriage and to sharpen your parenting and grandparenting skills. We want every child and student in this church to own a Bible and to know how to use that Bible, and we want to equip you to help us with that. We'll do it in the traditional Southland way with a lot of joy and a lot of creativity. We'll continue to have our men's conferences, our women's conferences, our middle school and high school conferences. We'll feed into that initiative and objective, but we're going to add to that a marriage conference and a parenting conference and a college student conference because we realize our culture is crumbling and it's crumbling quickly. And the option is not for God's people to hibernate and isolate. That is the typical reaction of churches and Christians. You know a lot of them. I do too. Who just want to pull their kids out of everything and protect them from everything and that's not an option. We've been given a mandate by our leader to be salt and light in this dark world. And so we're never going to take a defensive posture at this church because we have the victory We have the truth on our side, and so we're always going to take humbly, graciously, an offensive posture, and in this year especially, we're going to fight with every resource available to South and to strengthen the two institutions that God has established on earth, your family and his family, the church. So let me leave you with this picture. I had the privilege of teaching the fourth grade in Haiti for four years, and my favorite part of the day was Right at the beginning, we would open the gates to the school and hundreds of kids in uniforms would pour in. And they would play on the playground. Then at eight o'clock sharp, the bell would ring. And all the classes would line up single file teacher at the front and we would lead the students in the Haitian National Anthem. Beautiful little French song. The lyrics change every day. Really cool experience, powerful. And my favorite part was marching into those classrooms because I had 20 little kids behind me. Little kids who were leaving chaos and poverty and broken homes, and you can't even begin to fathom what was downstream there. But I had them in my room for seven hours, and so I was able to instill hope in them, and I loved it. But what broke my heart, worst part of my day ran concurrent with the best part of my day. When those school gates were open and those kids flooded in, there were more kids who couldn't get in. We didn't have enough classrooms. We didn't have enough teachers. We didn't have enough books and enough food to go around. We had to draw a line and cut kids out. Man, that broke my heart. Probably haunt me to the day I die. Can you imagine if in 1977 when my dad pulled into the parking lot of Disneyland, that excited little four-year-old boy that used to be me, jumped out of that car and ran up to the main gates of Disneyland only to find them padlocked? Walt Disney's on the other side with all of his cast of characters, and he looks at me and he says, I'm sorry. No, you, you can't get in. Oh, talk about devastation. Talk about frustration. I think that's why one of my favorite verses in all the Bible, favorite sentence, it's on the final page of the book where it describes heaven this way. It says its gates will never be closed at the end of the day because there's no night there. What's true of heaven is true of South and Christian Church. Our gates will never be closed. Our doors are always wide open to anyone. And I mean anyone. I don't care what condition or shape you're in. There's nothing you've said or done can make you be loved less. We want you here. And my prayer is that you'll tune into all the messages of this series. They're so critical. That you'll invite others to join us in this journey as we battle away from the badness for a little while towards the goodness of God, towards his home, the safety and security there, towards the freedom of this paradise he's created for us, I promise you, will be even better, far better than anything this world can ever, ever offer you. Let me pray for us. Father, we 
come before you today as individuals, recognizing that each of us are at different points in this journey. But we're grateful for Jesus, who built a bridge between you and us, made it possible for us to enter into your presence and to not be afraid, but to receive your help and your hope, your healing. God, we need that. So God, we're coming to you today and we're saying, help us to see inside of our hearts what needs to change. None of us have been loved by people the way we need to be loved, and yet you've made it possible for us to be loved by you. And we can be your sons and daughters. So God, we need that love because it's our only hope. And I pray, Father, that it would begin to ripple outside of this church, that Southland's light would just get brighter and brighter, that people would say, man, there's a difference in that place, that they would realize they can come here too and receive what only you can offer. And I pray, Father, it ripples beyond Kentucky and goes across our whole country. Father, I pray that we're not deceived by Satan anymore, that we realize there's a target. There's a target on us, our marriages and our kids. It seems like he's winning, but we know ultimately we have victory. So I pray, God, we live in that victory. And we remember the power that's been made available to us through your spirit. God, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for the Bible. Thank you, thankful for the words in it, what it speaks to us on a daily basis and the truth. God, we need that truth. We need to be confronted and challenged, but I pray we wouldn't shy away from it. I pray after today, God, our lives would be different. We wouldn't live like the world lives. We wouldn't talk like the world talks. We wouldn't consume the dangerous things that the world wants us to consume because we recognize how dangerous they are. God, thank you again for your love. We're grateful people. We're humbled people. Pray this in your son's name. Amen. Well, as we continue to worship this morning, we're going to move into a time of communion. Hopefully when you came into the room today, you got one of our take-home communion cups with a little piece of bread and some juice in the bottom. And as we take communion today, it's a reminder for all of us, as John said, that Jesus is the solution. And the Bible tells us that by his wounds, we are healed. That Jesus took upon himself the punishment for our sins so that we could have relationship with him, we could be restored to him, we can have peace with God because of Jesus. And so as we take communion today, we're thankful for God, he demonstrated his love for us by sending his son Jesus to die for us on the cross. And as we take communion today, just look around you because another thing we remember as we take communion is that we're part of God's family. And the people to your left and your right, they're your brothers and sisters. And we're here to love one another and serve one another and pray for one another. It's an incredible family that we get to be a part of. And again, it's all because of what Jesus did for us. Now, we want you to know that as your family, we want to be praying for you. We know you bring a lot of things into the room, challenges, frustrations, hardships, and we care. Uh, we care. We're called to care. We're called to carry each other's burdens. And I just want to invite you today to text us maybe one specific way that we can be praying for you and for your family. And that number is going to be up on the screen over the next few minutes. Our prayer team is also going to be here along the front of the room after the service today. And I know they would love to pray with you in person. But let's just take the next few minutes to focus on what Jesus has done for us all the problems he saw for us because of what he did for us on the cross.
Father God, we are so thankful for Jesus, for your plan. Lord, it is our prayer that our hearts look like yours, that our perspective is one seen just through Christ's eyes and not through the world's. God, help us to love one another well. I pray that you would change anything within us that needs to change, God, because we seek to honor and to glorify you. We love you with everything that we are. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. You guys, thanks for being here this weekend. It was an honor to worship with you. Just want to remind you, we've got prayer team members down front who would love to pray with you. want to invite you back next week for our second week in this series, Upstream. We'll see you next Sunday.